Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Great, good morning everyone. I'm happy to announce uh, and introduce Remco Chang. He's a visiting research scientist from uh, UNC Charlotte, working at the Charlotte Visualization Center. He's going to be talking today about his visualization techniques. By the way, I've seen some comment and notes, so I should point out that the George in a Box in a Corner is not a demo for this talk, it's just a visitor to the talk. You're welcome to go chat with him afterwards, beforehand, or anytime else. Also, for those of you watching remotely, I'll be happy to uh, pass on questions that you might have for Remco via IM. I'm Danielle Fisher. Again, I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Remco Chang today. He'll be talking about visualization. Remco? Well, thanks, Danielle. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, using interaction uh, in visualization. So the title is Thinking Interactively with Visualizations. Um, so I'm going to start with a little background about uh, how the visualization community typically thinks about interaction. So uh, this is not you know, a, a rigorous study or anything, but I, I believe that most people in our community believe that interactivity is essential to doing visualization and analysis. So we have some quotes here. Uh, the first one is from Illuminating the Path, which is kind of the research agenda for the vast uh, visual analytics community. And it says, a visual analysis session is more of a dialogue between the analyst and the data. The manifestation of this dialogue is the analyst interactions with the data representation. Uh, and similarly, there's an uh, 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 InfoVis paper from two years ago uh, that says basically without interaction, a visualization is just static images that you can't really do much with or, or, or animate images. Um, so uh, it's, it's pretty easy to believe that's true. But uh, as it turns out, if you kind of go through literature, there's really been a fairly limited amount of research uh, in our community that specifically focuses on interaction. So, uh, what ends up happening is, uh, uh, like what Yi and Stasco says from Georgia Tech, is that uh, people typically try to do visualization and then add the interaction to the visualization uh, as kind of a secondary thought. Uh, and there's really been limited amount of work where the focus is on the interaction and the visualization is, you know, maybe perhaps a second role. So uh, the, the goal of this talk is, is to consider the role of interaction in, you know, computer graphics, uh, visualization. I have to take out the word information, but, uh, but visualization in general and visual analytics. Um, so uh, the first thing I have to do is to take you all the way back to kind of where I got started thinking about this problem. And it really started about 15 years ago uh, when I was uh, doing my master's thesis. Um, and uh, back then I was doing offline rendering of animated characters. Uh, this is at Brown University uh, when you know, graphics was kind of just uh, uh, on, on the rise back then. Um, and this is uh, all offline rendered images. Um, and the thesis was really uh, about kinematic motion, de deformable meshes, and all that stuff. Uh, but, the, but the point about this is uh, it's very computationally heavy. Uh, and for a 10 second sequence, it would literally take all night. So before I go home, I'll code all day. Before I go home, I'll set a bunch of batches to run on various machines. And then I'll come in the next day to see what the results are. Um, so in that sense, it was actually really hard to debug uh, what I was doing because uh, effectively you have to remember what you saw last time or you have to review it from last time. And you really don't have a good sense of the you know, 50 parameters that you're tweaking and what their relationships are with each other. So this kind of uh, uh, offline process, this, this lack of interaction, uh, makes it really hard to think about the differences between each run. So kind of thinking about well, what, what would it take uh, to make this process uh, more interactive, and you know, if you just kind of flip through literature, people would typically say about 12 frames per second is necessary. And what that means is rendering a frame under 0.08 per second. And in the case of uh, my thesis, and among many other things, uh, this is often really, really difficult. Because you have really complex scenes with lots of polygons, uh, or a lot of information, at which point um, the computation becomes heavy. So the things you have to do is you have to simplify the scene, you remove some detail, and you have hierarchies of detail, uh, just to keep things interactive. And to give you an example of uh, what I think of uh, simplification, um, I'm using my example of uh, urban simplification that I did a few years ago. Um, and I'm showing you first the results. So what we have here are three images um, of rendering or, or simplifying an urban model. And you have uh, the original model on the left. The middle one uh, is about 45% of the polygon count. And the last one is about 18%. Um, 
And uh, uh, the, the key point about this is why you see subtle differences. Like for example, the, the last image looks a little bit dimmer than the first one. But the key point is that during the simplification process, you retain kind of the important features of the city. So the question then becomes, well, how did you choose the right polygons to remove? And this is kind of the crux of what simplification, in my opinion, uh, should be about. Um, so here I show you some examples of uh, simplification. On the upper left in the corner, we have the original urban model, as if you're looking from the top-down view. Um, and if you simplify this model using uh, kind of a traditional method like QSLIM, which is basically all based on geometry, what you end up having uh, are these kind of models where it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So, so semantically, it's, it's not quite the same as the original. Whereas our, our, our approach was to say, well, uh, using the same polygon count, instead of decimating it, let's aggregate them. And then we slap textures onto them. And if you compare the original with our texture model, it looks pretty similar. But what's really interesting about this project was that we were trying to calculate quantitatively uh, whether or not our approach was indeed better. And it turned out that it's not really. So what, what we did was we took these three models, uh, and we ran a fly-through scene, and we counted the number of pixels that are different from the original scene. Um, and we plotted this in terms of a percentage. So this will be 5% or so. Um, the actual number is not really the important part, but the important part here is that when you look at these three images, three models, they look really different. But uh, quantitatively, they are similar. The three lines are almost indistinguishable. So there's, there's a difference between quantitative and semantic meaning during the simplification process, which t traditional simplification does not really take into account. Um, and in this particular case, when we're thinking about the city, the goal of the simplification has to be about retaining the image of the city or the semantic, semantically important part of the city. Uh, and basically, uh, what we did within our application was to borrow um, uh, architectural theories or urban theories. In this particular case, we use this uh, concept called urban legibility, uh, which basically describes a city as saying the most important aspects of a city are paths, edges, districts, nodes, and landmarks. Uh, and this is based on Kevin Lynch's work, uh, who's an architect at MIT in the 60s. Um, and really, he was way ahead of his time, in my opinion. What he did was he sent a bunch of grad students out to Boston. And he said, well, just go out there, drive around. And when they came back, he asked them to start sketching what they remembered. So they came up with a stack of these kind of sketch maps. And Kevin Lynch basically sat there and flipped through this and said, well, what are the most important things that people remember during these sketches? Uh, and this is where he compiled the five elements. Um, so this is really interesting work to me. But uh, the, the, the core point about this is about the simplification aspect. But to take a little step back, and thinking about interaction and about the semantics of a city, what we realize is that when people think about a city, they don't necessarily just think about the geometry. So for example, we did an informal survey and said, well, tell me what you think about New York. Uh, and what we get are these kind of responses where people say, New York is large, compact, and crowded. Or somebody said, the area where I lived, uh, there was a strong mix of ethnicities. So if you take these two sentences and you kind of dissect it a little bit, uh, what you realize is that there are geometric aspects, where you talk about large and compact. Uh, there are information aspect of a city, where you're talking about being crowded and talking about ethnicities. And lastly, there's a very important point about a person's perspective about a city. So uh, there's this view dependence aspect uh, uh, to thinking about a city. Um, so what we did was we wanted to create a visualization that doesn't just uh, uh, focus on the geometry, but focuses on the overall impression of a city. And we end up having this information visualization uh, application that we call UrbanViz, where uh, it's, it's, a, it's a coordinated multi-view, where on the right-hand side, you have the geometry side. And the hierarchy of the shapes are based on the uh, rules of legibility. And we have the information side, where we try to pick the census information. And we just picked a few categories in terms of ethnicity, in terms of income, and so on. Uh, and we have a matrix view and a parallel coordinates view, which I'll get into a little bit later. But lastly, we have this uh, little yellow sphere that we have. Uh, which we can allow the user to control uh, to change their uh, or point of interest or their uh, 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 view dependency, so to speak. So um, I'm going to run a quick video. I usually actually demo this, but it turns out that it's pretty hard to demo this sometimes. Um, so uh, what I'm going to show you is basically uh, how this application could be used. So for example, the user can drag around this little ball. And what you see is that the information side on the left or on the left are updated according to what the user is uh, uh, interested in. Um, so in this particular case, I'm showing that 
on, on top of being able to drag your point of interest, you can change the degree of detail. So what that means is uh, if you bring the ball all the way up, then the aggregation becomes stronger. And if you bring it all the way down, you get more detail uh, around, around the sphere itself. Um, and in terms of interaction, uh, what the user can do is you can select or highlight uh, in any of the three views, and the other views will uh, correspond. So for example, in this case, we highlight a column, and you see the parallel coordinates line line up, and you see the, uh, um, the, the geometry aspect line up as well. OK. So two examples of how we conceive this application could be used. Uh, the first is in comparing different parts of a city. Um, where we're comparing downtown Charlotte to a, a, a town about 20 miles north of downtown called Davison, and we're trying to see how they are different. So what the user would do is bring the little yellow ball from Charlotte to Davison, and we look at the, uh, the matrix view. So what you see here is that uh, the, um, the areas around where there's red, so red is closer to where your point of focus is, you see a lot of jaggies. So basically it's... Uh, uh, there, there are tall spikes and little and, and low spikes. So this shows a great deal of heterogeneity um, in terms of ethnicity and income. Whereas if you look at the Davison area, it's basically flat. So this is a middle income, uh, white suburbia kind of, uh, kind of a town. So while the user is exploring, they can start looking at the matrix view to kind of get a sense of heterogeneity around the region. Um, and the second scenario would be, for example, looking for uh, uh, ethnicity pockets around the city. And in this case, what the user does is bring the ball down to the downtown Charlotte. And in the parallel coordinates view, we we'll select where there's high Hispanic population. So what's interesting about this parallel coordinate is that while the user selects these lines, first of all, you see all the white dots line up. So it tells you where the ethnic uh, clusters are. But if you follow these lines along, what you start seeing is that there are relationships between the variables. So in this case, we see that the Hispanic population has almost a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, their citizenship status. And if you come further along, you see that there's a negative correlation with income uh, and housing values and so on. So um, taking a step back, thinking about uh, the interaction or interactive techniques used in these applications, um, we refer to a paper, again, by uh, Yi and Stasco at Georgia Tech, where they kind of categorize interactions into uh, uh, different uh, uses. So what they said is you can use interactions to select, explore, reconfigure, and code, abstract, filter, and connect, which most of these are uh, implemented within uh, our system and a lot of other visualization systems as well. But what's interesting about this is if you really kind of uh, kind of lump it all together, uh, what we believe is that what Stasco is ex uh, describing is that you can use interactions to help you think. So while you're exploring, you're actually thinking about what you're looking for. So to try to convince you, I'm going to run through some applications that we've built. Um, and uh, hopefully at the end of it, you'll believe that uh, interactivity can be embedded into many, multiple different types of applications, and it actually does help with uh, the domain, uh, domain experts or the end users. So uh, the first case is the Wireviz project, uh, which we did with Bank of America. And this particular project was looking for suspicious wire transactions. Um, and we're looking for uh, uh, a temporal trends as well as different uh, uh, suspicious activities um, uh, over the course of a year. And the way that we kind of look at the problem is to consider the transactions as uh, relationships between keywords, so keywords within the transactions themselves, to the accounts or keywords to the keywords or keywords and count over time and so on. Um, so for example, keyword to keyword would be if you have a, uh, an entity in China who's selling baby food but sending money to the US company who supposedly is dealing in car parts, so the keyword baby food and car part should not really show up together. But if they do, this is something that you might be interested in. You might want to investigate further. Um, and this is kind of our overall interface. And the four different coordinated views are uh, used as heat map view, which shows the relationship between the accounts and the keywords. Uh, we have a temporal view, which looks at relationships over time. We have the keyword network graph, which uh, talks about when keywords are not supposed to show up together. And then lastly, we have this idea about search by example, which basically says, if you find a particular pattern or account that you're interested in, uh, show me other ones that are kind of like it. So I'm just going to show you this application real quick. I kind of preloaded this. Um, so kind of the point about the, this application and the interaction in it uh, is that when you're interacting with any variable in one view, the other view will uh, correspond. So in this case, the x-axis encode a list of the, the keywords. Um, so these are 
predefined words by analysts at the bank. Uh, we had to use numbers to, uh, um, to mask it because of proprietary and security reasons. Um, on, the y, or on the Y axis, we have clusters of accounts. So uh, when I say 98 here, it means that cluster has 98 accounts in it. And you can drill down into any of these where eventually you'll get to uh, individual account information. Um, so the, the bottom view, of course, is time. And what we can show is when I'm interacting with, let's say, the keywords, I can start to see temporal patterns. So in this case, uh, selecting the keyword of uh, uh, 37, what you see is that there's a strong temporal aspect of the keyword's occurrence. It does not show up anywhere in the first half of the year, but it shows up uh, uh, more frequently on the second half. And furthermore, on the network graph, you can see that keyword 37 shows up along with keyword 169. And this is where the analyst has to look at it and decide if that's questionable or if that's normal. Um, uh, and similarly, uh, you can select a particular day. So if you highlight over a day, you can see on that day uh, which keywords were used um, and which accounts actually transacted on that keyword. Um, a uh, second example I want to talk about is uh, a project that we did with uh, University of Maryland's uh, Depart or Center of Excellence on Study of Terrorism and Response to Terrorism. Uh, this case, we're looking at the Global Terrorism Database, which is compiled for the past uh, uh, 30 or so years. Um, it contains about 60,000 incidents over 120 dimensions. So this is recording all terrorist activities um, uh, around the world, so it's not just domestic. And the way that we designed the visualization was to uh, encompass this model of the five Ws. So we want to encode the who, what, where, and when. And I put why in the parentheses because the why part is not really visualizable. So this is a part that you're supposed to figure out as you're interacting. Um, so the interaction is designed so that the user can put in as many Ws as they know and try to see uh, what the correlation is. So this is the basic overall design. We have each of these boxes correlated to the who and the what and the where and the when. Um, and we have this box where you can always go back to looking at the original data, uh, as well as this evidence box, which is basically kind of a temporary save box, where if you found a particular group you're interested in, you'll put it in there, and then you can compare it to other groups um, later on. So just to show you a couple of examples of how this is used, um, here we're looking at the, the activity pattern of a particular group. Actually, this is Hezbollah. Um, and uh, what you see is that the, these lines are actually connecting uh, incidents in a temporal way. So two, two dots are connected would be uh, temporally next to each other. Um, so when you look at this graph, the obvious thing that shows up is you, know, you have this outlier where something happened in South America. Uh, it turns out to be Buenos Aires. Um, and if you look at it a little bit further, what you realize is that Hezbollah's attacks are not actually decided on uh, geographic locations. So, so that was actually news to us, because we always thought that Hezbollah uh, is, is active within the Middle East. But it turns out they're, they're actually everywhere. Um, in particular, uh, they're motivated, motivated by religious beliefs. In the case of what happened in Buenos Aires, it was a, a, a bombing at a mosque. Um, and if you look at their pattern over time, uh, what you see is that their attack patterns actually changed as the group developed. So in the beginning, you have more kidnapping. Sorry, the font's a little bit small. Um, which is a green, green stripe. And as it went on in time, around the early 90s, they start shifting to more bombing. And then afterwards, they kind of bend in bombing and just start doing facility attacks. So this is a kind of a temporal trend where you can see how the group's behavior is actually changing over time. Are you missing data from 93? Yes. Sorry. sorry. Missing data from 93. So that's not really us. It's actually somehow uh, the, um, the data collection site just had 93 disappeared forever. Um, so a second case is where we start with the where. So let's say we're interested in the Philippines. And if you highlight and select the region in the Philippines, what you see very quickly is that there's a very active group in the Philippines. And this is called the New People's Army. Um, so it's pretty obvious as a domestic group. They have never left Philippines. They've always been active strictly within the boundary of, this, uh, of the country. Um, but again, if you look at the temporal aspect of it, what you see is that um, while their attack pattern is fairly consistent, the amount of attack actually really changed. So they kind of took a quick rise in the 80s or 90s, and then, sorry, the late 80s, and then in the early 90s, it just kind of disappeared, and then it just completely, uh, uh, completely gone forever. Um, so we did some research into why this happened, and by research, I, re I mean literally going to Google, going to whatever search engine, and you start searching for news articles um, and see what's out there. 
And it turned out that the reason why they disappeared um, is that in 94, uh, they elected a new president, and one of his first act was to negotiate with all the terrorist groups and issued pardons. So this group was pardoned, and they just disappeared. Um, so this is the white part, where uh, you're motivated by what you see, but the white part you still have to find out. A uh, third example I kind of just put in, uh, really for George. <laughs> uh, this is a project that we did uh, this year, uh, where we're looking at the analysis of biomechanical motion. Um, so the premise is that biomechanical, biomechanical motion sequences, or animation, are really difficult to analyze. And to show you why that's true, I'll show you a simple video. Uh, this is a uh, this is an animation or motion sequence of uh, um, of a pig chewing. So this is running under half speed, and if I were to just move it forward uh, at normal speed, this is what the pig is doing. Um, and basically, all you see is that pig just goes open, close, open, close, open, close. Um, and it's really kind of hard to see what the pig is doing. Um, and you can watch this a million times. You can go frame by frame. And the fact is, it's really hard to see uh, the, the differences within the cycles. And as it turns out, there are differences. So uh, the, the claim that we make is that watching the movie repeatedly does not actually lead to understanding of the sequence. And actually, we didn't claim this. The, the biologist, the, the evolution, evolutionary biologist who used this uh, actually said this. Um, so this work is in collaboration with Brown University, who captured the data and people in Minnesota. And we're looking to examine the mechanics of a pig chewing uh, when they're chewing different type of foods or different amounts of food. Um, and one of the very obvious things that I learned is that uh, why you think about a, a, an animal chewing to be just kind of open and closed, as it turns out, that that, that jaw uh, joint is very, very complex. Uh, it can actually dislocate and just kind of do this almost like a bowl joint kind of motion. So it's not just like this. It's actually kind of like, you know. So, uh, when that happens, uh, the data is basically described not just as a, um, uh, uh, an angle, but it's actually described as transformation, uh, rotation, and translation of, of, of the rigid bodies. So this is kind of the overview that we have, uh, that we designed for, um, for the uh, evolutionary biologist. Um, and a lot of this is motivated by uh, George's work that I'll talk about a little bit later. But what we wanted to do was to give the user an overview about all their data. In this case, the different color, that's a little bit hard to see, but the different color uh, segments describe or show different takes on the experiment. So this will represent, for example, the pig chewing nuts, or this could be chewing pig feet or whatever. Um, and what we want to let the user do is to select and highlight anything that they see on the screen. And then we'll have detail view pop up where you can look at that particular segment of the sequence more carefully. Um, and we have additional information visualization things to help you kind of look at your data. But one of our key focus of this project um, was to look at uh, the interactive comparison part of looking at motion cycles. And this is definitely following George's work from last year where he talked about how to look at uh, animation sequences and their effects. Um, so. Uh, some of the techniques that we used are small multiples. So this is a small multiple view based on the previous image. And in this case, what we did was we took a tracer. So we, we looked at the, the, the pig's jaw, and we said we put a trace on the, on the bottom of the jaw, and we just let the animation play out and, uh, while it traces a, a pattern. So this, actually, this is actually really useful because, as you see, uh, in the small multiple sense, um, you can see when the pig is just literally open and closing versus if it's doing a grinding, which gives you kind of an upside down U shape, or if it's just kind of doing food gathering, in which case the, the jaw doesn't move. It's actually a tongue that's moving. So what you see is more like a little dot. Uh, so the jaw doesn't actually move. So in this case, you can start to see uh, under different conditions, uh, the, the pig is actually doing different things. Um, so we do side by side comparison. So in this case, we're looking at different runs and looking at the teeth distance. And so this is laying the, uh, the model side by side for different conditions. Um, we do overlaps. So we have two different types of ways to do overlaps. One is between two different data sets, so the, the yellow set and versus the green set. Um, or we can look at different cycles within the same data. So again, the cycle is defined as just open and close is considered as a cycle. And this is actually really neat, because um, if you just kind of plot out the cycles uh, so that they all originate at 0, what you see is, in this case, is very clearly um, at least two different uh, clusters of motion. So you have the bottom one where it's kind of uh, longer, 
uh, the middle one, and you have a little outlier that sticks out. So this is actually comparing the same motion sequence, but looking at cycles at a time. Um, and this is basically saying, well, we're going to let the user play as much as they want, and we give them as many comparison tools as, they, uh, as we can think of, or as George thought of, um, and see if they can actually do comparison of the data uh, using the tools. And the last example I'm going to talk about, I actually presented this paper, uh, Daniel and George heard this, I guess, uh, from, from this year's uh, Eurovis, where we're looking at uh, principal component analysis. So a little quick refresher of PCA, um, it basically is a regression analysis of sorts, where you're finding the most dominant uh, uh, eigenvectors as principal components. And in this particular case at the bottom, what you will show is uh, a bunch of data points in XYZ. And if you perform principal com component analysis, you can find PC1, PC2, and PC3. But in this case, what we can do is just kind of forget the third dimension and reproject it onto just the first and second dimension. Um, and you don't really lose that much. Um, the, the insight about PCA is that while I can teach uh, an undergrad how to calculate PCA, so it's kind of tedious, but you can do it, um, it's actually really hard to understand this semantically. So once I compute a principal component, I can tell you that it's a linear combination of the original dimensions. But what is the semantic connection between the two? So if I see a data point, how does it, where is it going to show up uh, on the plot, on the projection? It's really hard to kind of map in your head. And this is not just for novices. For most people, that, that relationship is really hard to understand. So what we seek to do is to say, well, so we have two different spaces. We have the original data space, and we have the eigen space. And we're going to try to see if we can use interaction to map between those two spaces so they can understand what their relationships are. Um, so this is the interface that we have. And I'm just going to show this as a quick demo. Uh, so we have loaded the data already. It's an eight-dimensional data. Um, and uh, you can zoom in. You can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but the key point I want to talk about here is of the eight dimensions, we have a slider for each one. So these are the original data dimension, whereas this projection is on PC1 and PC2. So the x-axis is PC1, the y-axis is PC2. You can choose the axis uh, as you see fit, but let's just stick with these two. So what we want to see is how does each original data dimension affect the projection? So in this case, what I do is I can change the contribution of one of the original data dimensions. And you can see as I'm changing this how that affects uh, the, the overall projection. So in this case, when I'm doing this, you can see a rotational effect. But you can also see that changing a little bit of this dimension actually affects the projection greatly. Whereas you know, I just keep playing with this, and what you will find is there's some dimensions that really don't do very much. Uh, so in this case, it really doesn't do a whole lot. Um, whereas in some cases, the dimension is really important to, uh, to the projection itself. Um, so we propose that. Uh, the interaction actually gives you some insight into the relationship because you can see the, trans or the rotational effect around some invisible axis. Whereas if I actually just show you as a static image, in this case I'm enabling trails, um, you really don't see the same rotational effect. You still see kind of a rotational effect, but it's almost as if it's rotating around uh, uh, some z axis coming out of the screen, when in fact that might not always be the case. So in, um, it's not really that rotating around some z-axis, but it's something a little bit harder to describe. Um, so, uh, so we implemented this. And what we wanted to see is if people can get a more intuitive understanding about PCA and the projection of spaces uh, using this kind of interactive system. Um, so we compared the tool to uh, SAS Insight, which is kind of a commercially available um, uh, mathematical package, really. Um, and the results that we find is that our system is a little bit more accurate, not a whole lot more. But what's interesting is people don't actually give up on the analysis. And I'll get to that a little bit later. And we also see that using our system is not faster. Um, but people do like it better. So um, uh, when we ask them to assign grades in terms of how easy is this to use and to understand, they give us more A's than the other guys. Um, and I'll talk about the results a little bit more later. But this is an interesting result because we had en envisioned that our devaluation would blow the SAS insight out of the water. And that was not really the case. So I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. But one of the key points um, that I need to talk about is I've been proposing that interaction is the same as thinking. So you can use interactions to think. And this is a pretty strong claim. Um, so the, the kind of question that we need to ask is, well, 
what is in a user's interaction? And if you really believe that interaction is the same as thinking, then can we learn something from the interactions? Or better yet, is it possible that you can take the thinking out of the interactions and do something with it? Um, so to answer this question, again, take half a step back to think about what is in the user's interactions. And if you kind of look at the model of a user and a computer, I'm going to assume the computer here is a visualization. Um, what you have is a very simple model where you have the visualization on one side, the human on the other side. And you have the person looking at the visualization, which is kind of in, in, in the form of an output or images through the monitor. And when the user interacts with the visualization, you have this input through mouse and keyboard. So minus the sound and all that, this is actually kind of a, an obvious relationship, but it's a pretty simple relationship between you and a computer. That's it. You have the image and you have the mouse and the keyboard. But if you kind of categorize how we usually use computers, I kind of roughly categorize into three different things. So there's a kind of, kind of type of text editing where you do a lot of typing. You're not really reading a lot from it. You're just verifying it, really. On the other side, you have this uh, output heavy where you're watching a movie where you click play and you just sit back and watch. So there's very little interaction, but there's a whole lot of output. Um, whereas if you, uh, the, the way that we design visualization and visual analytics, um, that relationship is actually closer to 50-50. So you're interacting, you're seeing the result, and you know, create a feedback loop, and you interact some more, and you see the result more. Um, and in this particular section, when I talk about what's in a user's interaction, I'm actually specifically focusing on the bottom one. So I'm not talking about the other two. Um, so we, we wanted to perform a, uh, we want to do a study where we want to prove that there really is thinking within the user's interactions. So this is, this is the goal that we set out to prove. And the experiment is a little bit complex. So you kind of have to bear with me a little bit. Um, so what we have is we, we got a bunch of financial analysts. And these are analysts from Bank of America, from Wachovia. So all the big banks uh, were previously known as Wachovia, now it's something else. When I ran the study, it was still called Wachovia. Let's just say that. Um, so we got a ten, 10 of these analysts. And we asked them to use the Wirevis tool that I talked about earlier to perform financial fraud analysis. So uh, we gave them some specific tasks. And, uh, and, and you know, they, they try to find uh, fraudulent, suspicious activities uh, using the tool. So while they're doing this, we're logging everything that they're doing. And I put the word semantic in parentheses because we're not logging uh, x, y mouse positions or keystrokes, but we're, 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 we're monitoring which visual element they've highlighted or which thing that they double clicked on. So it's actually semantically more meaningful um, and only meaningful to the application. It's not meaningful at all to other type of application. Um, so on the other side, we have a bunch of grad students that we call coders. And we gave them another tool that we developed we're looking at interaction logs. And we fed the semantic interactions into this interaction log. And then we ask the grad students to just take guesses about what the analyst strategies are. Okay, so we collect that. And we go back to the analyst and said, well, what were you actually doing? Right? So we showed them the video of what they did. And we just asked them to tell us what their strategies and what their findings and methods are. And then basically, we just compare them to see how close they are. So the key point here to mention again is that the grad students have no uh, knowledge of financial fraud analysis, um, and they, have, they didn't actually see the analysts do anything. So they're a completely separate group that have no interaction with each other. Uh, the only interaction is me and the, uh, the co-author where we do the comparison at the end. Um, so what we, sh what we show is that uh, the hypothesis is that if, there is a, uh, if you can extract a lot of thinking, then uh, the two would be fairly similar. And we're actually really surprised by this result. Um, we were expecting that you can probably extract like 25, 30%. And as it turns out, uh, the numbers blow our expectations out of the water. So in this experiment, we find that um, our coders can extract uh, up to about 60% of the high level strategies, 60% of the mid level methods, and 79%, 80% or so of uh, what the analysts actually found. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, if we kind of uh, look at this a little bit more, um, is that we wanted to look at what type of things that they were able to extract and what type of things they were not able to extract. So what we did was we plotted the participants. So these are the financial analysts from 1 to 10. And we looked at how well uh, their, how accurate uh, their finding strategy and methods could be extracted. And the two that immediately stuck out are these two little low bars. Um, so again, you know, everything was kind of roughly about the same. but. Yeah. What? This is how accurate they are in. in no, sorry. How accurate we? How how accurate how the well grad students? Okay. Right. Sorry. Okay. How accurate the grad students are 
at guessing what they were doing. Got it. Okay, sorry. Um, and uh, so the two things that really st stuck out are these two little green bars at the bottom. Uh, and the question is, why are these so much lower than the others, right? So uh, the, the, the coders were only able to recover about 15% of these two analyst methods, in particular their methods. Um, so we went back to watch the video to decide well, what happened here. And what we saw was that the, uh, the analyst strategy or method uh, in, in discovering fraud was looking for spikes within the data. So in this particular case, they're looking for spikes in amounts, right? Spikes in amounts over time. Um, so if you think about the only thing that the grad student had were uh, interaction logs, they don't have what the analyst actually saw, so they have no way of guessing that the, the reason that the analyst clicked on these uh, transactions was because of the spikes, because they couldn't see what the analyst saw, they only had the transaction logs. Um, so the understanding here is that uh, just capturing the user's interaction in this case is, in, is insufficient. So it's not enough to just look at the interaction logs. You actually have to kind of get a sense of what they're actually looking at, being a visualization application and all. Um, yes, sir. Um, just um, right there. What about some of the other ones? How, how were they so successful? Um, so that's a really good question. I think um, uh, why were they so successful? So, uh, actually, let me let me let me take a, uh, there's, yeah. I'll, I'll get to that a little bit. Yeah, hopefully I'll answer that without answering it directly. Um, but okay, thinking about what we learned from this experiment, uh, the first thing uh, we can claim is that I think we successfully have proven that a great deal of the thinking is actually encoded within the interaction logs and is extractable and capturable. Now I didn't say anything about using a computer to do it, but at least the information is there, right? Um, so kind of projecting a little bit further, we're saying that if you can capture this type of semantic interaction, and we can collect all this stuff, and we can extract all these things, then the hypothesis is that we can actually call this kind of a knowledge base. So this is where I start waving my hand because I haven't done any of this work. But, but the thinking is that if the interaction logs do contain thinking, and you can collect all this thinking, then why don't we put it together uh, for future use? So we're talking about training, guidance, verification, and all that stuff. Um, but as we show, not all the visualizations are interactive. So you have visualization where it's basically watching a movie. And certainly not all the thinking uh, is reflected in the interactions. So um, what we start to realize is we need some kind of understanding about what is, in, what is in fact capturable, what is extractable, and what are the things that you can do in terms of getting the thinking out of it. Um, and we start working on this, and we submitted a paper, and it got horribly rejected. We got terrible scores. Um, so we kind of have to go back to the thinking board uh, uh, to think about what this model might be. Um, so this used to say in submission to InfoViz this year, but it got horribly rejected, so now it says I'm thinking about sending it somewhere else. Um, so kind of just to wrap it up a little bit, uh, I'm going way faster than I normally do, but hopefully that's okay. Um, so some of the conclusions that we can draw from this, uh, the first assumption is that uh, I hope I've shown that interaction are, interactions are important for visualization and visual analysis. Uh, and uh, the first thing I talked about was in considering interactions, we must be aware of what it takes to make something interactive. And in the case of large amount of information, we have to do some kind of simplification level of detail approximation. But the, the, the key insight from my own experience is that while you do all these things, you just have to be really careful about what you're actually taking out. And a lot of times, a quantitative measurement might not be enough. So you have to consider the semantic and the qualitative aspect of things. Um, and the second thing is I hope I've shown that interactions uh, could be useful. Um, and we have shown that it are, it's useful sometimes, a lot of times, <laughs> in different domains and different applications. Um, and in, in some cases, the interaction is the difference in terms of uh, the, the analysis process. And the last point is uh, capturing and storing analyst interactions we believe have great potential. Um, it, it could potentially be aggregated into a knowledge base, uh, which it's really, it's really been pretty hard to do for a lot of the disciplines. So some of the things that people have done are ontologies, formal ontologies, and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of those things are either like giant trees of lots of different possibilities or whatnot. And this might be a different way about thinking of what is a knowledge base. Um, so while I've talked all these things about what interaction is great for, I have to talk about the things that it's not good for. So first of all, it's horrible for presentation, right? So I'm sitting up here trying to tell you interaction I can't, without actually showing you a video or actually playing with it, uh, it's, it's really hard to convince you of such. 
Um, but more importantly, what we realize is that when you have something, a visualization system that's just openly interactive, uh, you have this problem of your mileage may vary. So reproducibility is a huge problem. Um, even within the same user, every time they walk up to something like this, they do something different. So two different users, totally completely different. Um, and evaluation becomes a, a bear because sometimes you discover some things, sometimes you don't. So when somebody says, hey, tell me how accurate your system could be in, in discovering fraud and using wireless, I have no number because sometimes they do great, sometimes they do horribly. I myself went through a similar process where looking at the bank data, I saw something really bizarre. It was some company that's called Red Cross something or other, but it's not Red Cross, and it's dealing in diamonds out of Russia. And I'm like, that can't be right. And I was so excited, I was going to show it to somebody. Um, and I closed the app accidentally. I just restarted it, and I couldn't find it again. I was digging everywhere. I had no idea what I saw the first time, and the path was just lost. So this makes the evaluation incredibly challenging. And the last point is, when we, when we develop these kind of interactive applications, we often sacrifice accuracy. So again, the simplification process. Um, in the IPCA, what we did was, instead of using the traditional singular valid decomposition, uh, we have to use an iterative approximation method that's called online SVD. We didn't come up with it, it was some mathematical journal that somebody did this. Um, and it's not as accurate, but it makes the computation time much, much faster. And in the wireless case, uh, we realized that we can't really do clustering of large data sets. Um, so instead, we use this really dumbed down version that we call binning. It's just basically histogramming in some ways. Um, but the difference is uh, now you allow people to do clustering on the fly, but then you have to do it in a really dumb way. Um, so it's, it's this balance about speed versus accuracy. Uh, and interestingly, as I talked about earlier, uh, when we compare interactive apps versus non-interactive apps, we don't see really a drastic time improvement. We do not see a great increase in terms of task performance accuracy. Um, but we have observed empirical evidence um, that, first of all, the users are more engaged. So in this particular case, what we show is these two little green bars that stands for non-applicable are basically participants who use SAS Insight for a while, and they just say, I quit. I can't figure it out. I have no idea what's going on. So they just gave up. Whereas using more interactive apps, they're more engaged, so uh, they, they're, they're more focused and they kind of just lost track of time. They just keep going until they actually find some answer. Um, and by the way, the answer might not be right, but they at least will go all the way to the end. Um, and you know, we show that uh, in terms of user preference, interactive apps are more, much more preferred than the other. Um, but the last point is the most important one, but it's also the most subtle one, is that we find that the users have a faster learning curve. So, what that means is the first time they do it, they might be horribly slow. But as they start using it more, they actually learn the problem domain in a much faster way than if they do a, a static application. So the example, uh, this is a separate study uh, where we looked at interactive online maps, like you know, in, in our case, we're looking at Google Maps and Google Earth. And compared to the traditional um, uh, GIS application, like uh, the ESRI, ArcMap, ArcGIS, um, when, what we realized is that uh, where the user is spending most of the time is in exploration. So they zoom in and out, they pan all the time. When, they have, when you give them interaction, they use it, right? Um, so if you think about what they're doing during this playing around, is that they're actually building contextual information. So now they actually have some better understanding, a mental model about the neighborhood, about the community, about what's around the point of interest. Whereas if you have the traditional one where they just create a bounding box and zoom right in, they don't gain that con contextual information. So what this means is, if you ask them to do a similar task the second time, the people who had the Google Maps, who had the stuff where they had the exploration, don't have to go through that process again. You can jump right to the answer much faster than the original one. Um, but what all this says to me is that you know, right now we can't just measure uh, uh, kind of the benefit of interaction using uh, the traditional time or accuracy. There's got, there's got to be something else. There's got to be new ways of testing it, new measurements or new methodologies for doing this. Um, so kind of wrapping it up about future work, um, I'm really interested in urban visualization. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do is to show a, a new type of map where it's not just about the street layout, but show you the characteristic of a city. So this is the kind of stuff that when you go visit a friend in a new city, he draws for you on a little napkin and hands to you and says, okay, this is roughly where everything is so you won't get lost. This is the kind of map that we don't have, right? This is the kind of map that's often the most useful, but often we do not have these things. So uh, one of the future work for me is to actually look at how we can create what we call semantic maps. Um, 
And we want to apply uh, interaction in visualization in other domains just to continue with this line of thinking. Uh, we have a couple of proposals accepted to look at studying science policies with NSF, uh, to look at uh, civil strife. So um, we're looking at causality between the government oppression of people and the people reacting by having riots and see how you know, the negotiation between the two pan out. Um, and then we wanted to evaluate the benefits of interaction uh, more, quote unquote, scientifically. Um, and lastly, about interaction capturing, or what's so-called provenance, is we want to look at semi-automatic methods for actually studying the interaction logs. So, so far we've just asked people to do it, but we want to see if we can actually do this through machine learning, data mining, and that kind of good stuff. Um, and we're looking for a collaboration uh, with the Pacific Northwest Lab to look at more generalizable structure for recording the provenance. And that sums it up for me. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. We have some time to take questions. About 15 minutes. Yes, sir. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on, on that question before, which was sort of, OK, obviously there were cases where they just really didn't get it. But right. can we get a little bit of why they were so accurate at all? You know, what, what, what were the strategies that they could so, look at? So I've given this talk about three, four times. And every time I've given this talk, one of our UNC uh, grad students was with me. And they're able to kind of talk about it from the coder's perspective. And this is actually part of the problem with the study, where I deliberately did not participate in the coder process. Um, I actually participated in the analyst process, and therefore I did not feel right to participate but in the other. You also showed the wire this, but you never showed us the interaction log this. Yes. So I don't even know what, what it is. I understand. OK. Like. So um, this is a little bit hard to see, so I, have, I just kind of have to talk about this very high level. Um, what we have is this visualization where the x-axis again time. Okay. So each, each row here. Uh, has a different meaning and a representation. So the top, the A part, is actually for, for annotations. So in this case, we don't have annotations. We hit the annotations. But uh, the subsequent three things uh, represent each of the views in Wireviz. So this, is, this, this application I didn't talk about because it's really tailored for the Wireviz app. Um, so if the user interacts with one of the views, or with, with one view, it will show up here. Uh, with the other view, it will show up here and here. Okay? Um, and because Wireviz is designed so that the relationships uh, or the, the views are really specifically focused on one type of relationship, you can start guessing, right? So if they're interacting with a heat map view, then they're looking for a relationship between time or keywords and accounts. If you're looking at the temporal view, then they're probably interested in time and so on. Um, and here, the bottom one, these two, uh, uh, show you the depth of the investigation. So how far down the hierarchy tree uh, are they looking at? And the last one is just looking at the time range to see which, which, which time slice that they're actually zoomed in on. Okay, so uh, what I observe, and this is just my observation of the of the coders doing this, is they just look for clumps of patterns. So, for example, when I show you that you can just kind of mouse over keywords, and if they do that just kind of repeatedly, um, you just see a whole lot of dot on this graph, I believe, right? So when you see that, then you realize that that's what the user is trying to do: is either looking for the relationship temporally or in terms of how they correlate. Now, what what's important is where do they go next. Right. So if they go to the temporal view, then it tells you something. If they go to the different view, it tells you something. If they start clicking on the accounts, it tells you something else. So I believe these are what they are looking for. Um, and one of the things that I didn't get to talk about a little bit here is that um, what's intriguing to me is that uh, when, the when the students did the first participant, they were horribly slow. So um, if the analyst did it for 20 minutes, they would take like 30 minutes to analyze the data set. So it renders that this method completely useless as far as time goes. They might as well just watch the whole video. But as it went on, so by the 10th participant that they're investigating, they're super fast. They're going through it in, in, in a matter of minutes and seconds. So there's something that they learned uh, while they're looking at this. And they're actually just kind of learning repeated strategies from different people. Um, and every once in a while, you, you get some guy who gets stuck because it's a new behavior that's never been seen before. Then they spend more time. But overall, what's intriguing to me is that um, what the, what, the participant, or what the coders found is not a fluke, because it's learnable. Right? As they went on, the accuracy did not decrease, but the time went up. So they're learning something. Whatever it is, they're learning something. So it's not just ad hoc kind of fluky that they found something. So, Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering for this, for this direction log, right? I mean, it seems, it seems what, what people are really picking up on is you know, static activity, where it's, it's sort of people do repeated activity in the same part of the visualization, and then there's a transition to yes. another one. 
So would it, would it make sense to sort of think of you know these interactions in, in kind of in a network fashion where you have nodes where, where people stay in, in one right. area and, and use things, right. and then they transition to another area and, and look at a different right. information aspect? That's, that's, that's a really good point. Now, the assumption, however, you're making, this is what we wrote in the paper that got horribly rejected, and I really don't understand why. <laughs> they just don't see my brilliance. Um, I think uh, uh, the implication about being able to do the capturing and talking about all the semantic is that your visualization has to be encoding those things to start with, right? So, so the question is, if I give you three views that basically all do the same thing, then your interaction log is not going to tell you anything because you can't follow along uh, with that type of thinking. And you'll be surprised at how many visualizations have redundant capabilities between views, right? So the fact that our visualization was designed so that they are fairly disjointed makes it a lot easier, okay? Um, so this is the lesson learned afterwards, that you know, thinking about how to design better interaction capturing actually implies designing better visualizations. Well, what do you, I don't know whether it's implying better visualizations, because you might want the redundancy in the visualization because Sorry, that's you're right. what it has right. better. Absolutely. So absolutely. if your goal is to be able to capture after that. Absolutely. So this is where I got horribly dinged in the review process, because I basically said, in really thinking about this, I realized that there are times where inter designing a visualization for the purpose of use versus designing visualization for capturing, sometimes they actually clash. They don't actually fit into each other, or at least I, couldn't, I wasn't smart enough to figure out how they fit into each other. Um, because you don't want that redundancy. You actually want a single pipeline flow. And you don't want to encode three different information in the same icon. Right? You want each icon to be disjoint, to be precise, so the interaction will be meaningful. Now, if you think about all visualization design and traditional kind of the Tufty design, they're basically saying cram as many things in, as possible into as little space as you can. So that would, that would make the interaction capturing really, really challenging. Right? So if you click on an icon that has seven different layers of meaning, why did he click on, click on this? Well, I don't know. It could be one of the seven things. Uh, and I'm being hammered on this, and I knew I was going to be hammered on this. <laughs> but go ahead. Actually, there's a question from George first. Oh. Yes, sir. Yeah, it seems to me that when you're trying to evaluate interactivity, um, you have to take into account the nature of the tools that you're using for interactivity. And so I was thinking about, for example, uh, the task of finding a needle in a haystack, the literal task of finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, the simple interaction technique would be to browse through that haystack and, and tell you to find the needle. That's obviously not the way to do it. A slightly better way would be to use uh, a detector and use that to probe the, the haystack. That's better. Uh, an even better way would be to use a, a big electromagnet Place there, <laughs> the yeah. So there, all three of those are interaction techniques, but because the, the, major, the tool you're using to interact with the data changes the task significantly, and somehow in your the evaluation, the way you presented it, you don't seem to be taking into account the nature of the, uh, the tools that you're using. I, I agree, and I think. Um, uh, uh, part of the challenge in the future research uh, is to see if it is actually possible to to differentiate or to isolate the factors saying this is really coming from interaction and this is not. So in one of the possible future study that we're planning to do was to take, for example, the PCA project and fix out the interaction. So just lock it out. You can't do it anymore. Right? So we'll have the exact same app but you know with more of a query typing interface versus more of a kind of a slidey bar you know, direct manipulation type of interface and do task and comparisons. So we, we do want to isolate the factor. And, and uh, what we're trying to say, again, similar to the spirit of this uh, interaction study is to, or this uh, interaction log study is to say, I don't really know what's in it. I don't know what the strategies are, but I want to know if there is uh, some benefit of such. Um, so uh, if I can just show some applications in which you know, you take out certain type of interaction, there, and all of a sudden the user can't do X, Y, and Z. Um, then uh, we can at least say that there is some benefit to it. Now, I absolutely agree that this is totally application dependent, um, but in in kind of looking around in terms of visualization, interaction, research, and evaluation, I just really haven't been able to come up come across that many things that actually did the isolation uh, uh, clearly to the point where we think we can use. 
Um, so it's, it's a wide open area, and I really don't have all the answers. I think it's like a huge problem. Um, and I, this is really just tiny stab number one. So I guess we can also think about the visualization that you use for the visualization of the, or of the interaction. Yes. Right. What? So, for, so for example, you happen to choose a timeline view that's oriented towards showing you which window users were clicking in. Yes. Which is useful and interesting, but it would be a very different view if you showed me, say, which object in the data users were interacting yes. with. Yes. Yes. Or. But yeah, I totally agree. But you have to take a step back and looking at what our original hypothesis and goal was. The goal was to say, is there any thinking? Is it extractable in any way? And the fact that I can get 60, 80% out of it means that there is at least something. I don't know what's there. I don't know what I'm missing. Um, I don't know how I can get to 100%, but at least I show that there's something in it. Um, uh, now, I hope that, you know, part of the research is to say, well, let's beat 60%, right? And let's beat 60% not on wireviz, but on everything. Um, and I don't know what that is. Uh, yes, sir. I just had a uh, simple clarifying question on this slide. So, yes. so what is it exactly that the grad students were writing down and the analysts were writing down, and how did you compare them to see if they were the same? That's, that's a great question. Um, so we, we had to break down uh, um, an analyst process into three areas. So what we realized is that uh, we have this kind of a hierarchy of, of process in terms of the analysis. The first is kind of a strategy level, so the highest level. It's before they come into the analysis, they have some preconceived notion about what they're going to look for. So in the case of, uh, so this is a synthetic data, so we're not talking about real Bank of America data, but they would come in, they'll look at the keywords and they'll say, you know what, I think anything with Mexico and pharmaceutical is odd, right? So that would be, for example, a strategy. Now, uh, the, the second tier would be the methods, which says, okay, let's say that is Anything related to that is questionable. What do, you, what do you do? What do you start? So you can either look at accounts that have those two things together, or you can look at the temporal pattern in which those two things are close together, or, or various other things that you can actually do to implement your strategy. So that's what we call methods. And the last thing is findings. So finding is very precise. It's about which account or which transaction uh, uh, actually contain suspicious activity that, that the person deemed to be questionable. So. Um, we, we categorize those three types of behaviors. I mean, this is a rough categorization. I think if you look at analytical literature, like there's a much better hierarchy of sorts. Um, but we kind of roughly categorize it into those, those, those three areas. Does that answer your question? Not quite. I mean, okay. that, that, that sort of tells me, it gives me a rough idea of what the concepts were at the three levels. But I mean, were the grad students, I mean, were there like a fixed set of codes and the grad oh, students writing yeah. down saying, at right. time A, I saw this code? Gotcha. No, no, no. So, so there's no code. It's all just kind of handwritten. It's, it's interviewed. So there's a lot of transcribing going on here where um, especially like, so the, these two processes are the same. So the analysts telling us what they did, uh, you know, we're, we're transcribing what they, what they told us uh, um, from words into literal things. And there's definitely a, quite a bit of, you know, us as the comparison people to be as unbiased as possible. So like I said, the study, is, there's quite a bit of hand waving. Um, but one of the things that I can say very safely is that we took a very safe approach on this. So I genuinely was, genuinely was interested in what I was going to find. So anything that do not match perfectly, we toss out. So for example, if the analyst says my strategy was looking for Mexico pharmaceutical in Brazil, and our student says uh, Mexico and pharmaceutical. So if they miss Brazil, we don't give partial credit. We consider it as wrong. So we, we, we take a very, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but basically anything that's not perfectly right, we consider it as wrong. OK, so the interaction logs actually do contain the data elements themselves. Not just they were looking in this window, but they were looking at this window and focusing on, quote, Mexico, unquote, right? I right. Mean, the data so, is encoded in the interaction logs. Yes, yes. So, so which, which visual element they're highlighting or which visual element they interacted with, gotcha. that's what we're storing. We don't care about the XY position of the mouse. Yes. There's been a lot of research on the, the benefits of animation and comprehension. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been part of that. Yes. And um, I'm just wondering if you're never going to get to 100% because possibly the design of your user interactions isn't quite right. Yeah. Or yeah. It doesn't quite match the task perfectly. And I, leads to misunderstanding or confusion. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, even if you it would take, take 20 steps back, and you can say that a lot of analysis actually happens in someone's head. And unless you have some fMRI thing or something where, you know, um, uh, 
so, so one of our uh, research goal was to say, well, let's be kind of practical about this, right? So we have to imagine an environment. So the environment could be, let's say you're at the bank. So you can't attach all these external things. You can't look at giant, you know, 30 cameras around the guy's desk. You can't have an fMR stuck on his head, or, or sorry, an EEG stuck on his head, or an fMR sitting in the back. So all of that is out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think the bank would let us. Uh, yeah, but um, you're absolutely right. So, so like I was saying to Daniel, the um, part of this research was actually just to answer our own question that says, we've seen a lot of people try to do interaction capturing that fail. And I hate to talk about this because it's almost like, you know, bombarding other people's work. But the PNNL glass box was, according to Jim Thomas, a complete failure. It's a multi-million dollar failure. I know that uh, Stuttgart tried to do something and it didn't work out. Um, Google tried to do something and it didn't work out. So there's a lot of people who try to do this that did not work. And the first question we had was, given all these failures and very little success as far as we were able to find, is this even reasonable to pursue, right? It, it, is, can you actually get uh, thinking analysis, high level strategies, just by looking at interactions? So that was definitely our step one. And I think once we've proven to ourselves that um, uh, using the most kind of manual way, there, there is something, then we can think about, well, what do we do wrong? Can we improve that number and so on? So. You actually uh, touched on this before. So uh, there, there were a lot of other studies in Google which you know, didn't really have very confusing results. What do you think you know, makes this particular analysis so successful at getting you know, right. the intent of the... You should have been my reviewer, because that's what I wrote about. Nobody seemed to care. <laughs> but um, uh, so I think um, the, what I started to realize, like I said, was uh, um, when you want to get good results in the capturing, at least our own experiences, it starts with the designing the visualization, right? So again, we, we didn't design it thinking about capturing. We designed it kind of two years beforehand. But whatever it is that I did uh, uh, made every visual element very straightforward. It doesn't have multiple meanings in the same visual element. Right, so I don't encode hue and transparency and whatever all into one glyph, right? Because once you do that, you click on it and you have no idea why the user clicked on it. And I did not do a horrible amount of redundancy. There is some redundancy between the views, but there's, you know, uh, the, the semantic meaning behind each view is fairly clear, right? So when you have that kind of isolation in terms of both the window space or the design space and the visual elements themselves, um, then any sort of interaction with these things become very obvious about what they mean, right? So um, what I realized about the success of this is not really what we did as an experiment, but really was kind of an uh, indication that the original design of Wireviz was really suited for capturing. Um, it's not necessarily implication that it's good visualization, but it's really good for capturing. Um, so. Uh, the question is, is this generalizable? And I don't have an answer, right? And does it mean that other people should design their visualization to be capturable? I don't really know. Um, but uh, um, I think you can't separate the two. You can't say that we're going to have good capturing techniques without thinking about what the visualization does. So. Well, all right, is there any other question? Oh, well, thank you so much. I'd like to thank our speaker once more. Thank you.